Welcome back, everyone, to uh, our dating sim series. And uh, <laughs> you're in the middle of our new show where we rate uh, the dating sim games based on their level of dreaminess. On this episode, Josh is going to be uh, asking out the high school heartthrob for some uh, sorbet. How lunch. did we just do? Sorbet. <laughs> Jesus Christ, guys. Is that the game we're playing? You promised me we were doing it this time. You never do anything I wanted to. I guess we're playing Metal Gear again. Like, right. all we ever fucking do. Ugh. That is all we do. This fucking game, man. This fucking game. It's like, it's like a fucking chore. Didn't you already take this guy out? I've taken this guy out too many times. He's living some sort of, like, weird existential groundhog's day. <laughs> thing. He just walks the same plank in the same patterns over and over again. He just keeps dying over and over Getting and over killed again. by Snake. Dora has a bloodlust. Not uh, Snake. That needs to be quenched. Not Snake. Dora, the player. <laughs> yeah, me, personally. Threw it at the camera. You see that? That yeah. was really yeah. cool. It, it felt like it was coming right at us. It's <laughs> <laughs> like it was 3D. That pal key. <laughs> it's just funny because, like, this was made in the 90s. So he, the fact that this mission control setup has like laptops it's like man futuristic yeah yeah is even that... even the sounds of it and yeah. this little thing that goes down i don't know what the hell that goes down for but yeah. it looks cool yeah super futuristic and it spits out the key okay. there goes like a disc tray yes yeah, i feel like the keys on those keyboards are super raised though yeah like the way that they're drawn well they did the laptops back then the keyboards were like you had to really push them down to make a make them uh, respond So we're going to heat it up, right? Yep. we get hot. Getting a little hot in here. A little spicy. One of my favorite areas of the game. Oh, yeah. The Terminator 2 area. Yeah. It yeah. looks really... Just, I don't know. It's just the colors there. Um, I don't know. Lots well, it's of... really cool because the rest of the game is uh, cool. Well, yeah. Really cold, mm -hmm. uh, subdued tones. And that's the one area in it that's hot and red. God and damn It just guy. stands out. Which kind of sucks because when you go back in Metal Gear... Well, I'm... Okay. Stop... <laughs> Well, yeah, it's not really a spoiler. In a different game, it makes a reappearance, and it's it, they take away because it's been, it's mm -hmm. not a foundry anymore, and it just kind of robs you of that moment of like, oh, it's the foundry, and then it's like it just looks like everything else, and it's kind of right. boring. That's kind of, but I guess probably ties into the theme as well, though. I, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah, I just really like the, the break in color, like this. Yeah, like you said, in general, in general, the game has this very greenish blue tone to it. Lots of like industrial, like gray and yeah, and a very uh, desaturated. Whereas that room is like very bright and it's, it's a nice kind of intense. Yeah. yeah, it definitely stands out. Like when I think back to this game, that's definitely like one of the areas that stands out the most to me as well. You know, it kind of makes you wish that they did that more. Well, that well that. For me, it sounds like it speaks to like, I guess restraint. Mm -hmm. Like they have a tone and a look for the entire game, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of games that will uh, vary their color palette across the entire game. Like they have these, um, I forget the exact terminology, but it's like they have these storyboards of sorts that are like color um, maps of mm -hmm. how the game is going to look as you progress through the game. Uh, whereas this game has sort of like a cohesive yeah. look to it, but yeah. there's these uh, breaks in it. Like, this is an even more yeah. extreme I was version say, of blue. Yeah, I was going to say this is just like the foundry area, but except for it's extreme cold as opposed to completely different. Right, so it's it's less about, like, constantly trying to change the color palette and keep it uh, visually interesting by changing the color of it and more about, I don't know... They could do that, but it seems like they have an overall tone and look they want to go for. But having that, like, having that foundry or having that freezer does add a little bit to it, changes it up a little bit. Yeah. But it's not. Um, are you punching the birds? You bird. are fucked up. <laughs> I, Fuck these the birds. The fact that it, like, swirl, like, falls and swirls <laughs> down and goes under the elevator, it's just, that's pretty brutal. Fuck these birds. They have Raven in them. <laughs> Literally, they have yeah. Raven in them in their they stomachs. Do. Yeah, but Josh, what you're saying about that, I think that's pretty cool. And uh, again, 
I feel like that's something that's drastically lacking for Metal Gear 2. I was just going to say that. There's not really a room that changes up. Yeah, you, there, it's all the same. Well, I guess you could... Even when it's like... You could compare the opening to Big Shell. Yeah, the but, color that's, shift. but that's that's a whole different thing about the split in the game. Uh, yeah. But the, but, uh, the opening tanker looks like Shadow Moses. Yeah. That, like, that's the reference. It's the same that's industrial same tones. tones. Yeah. yeah. Which is funny because I guess you could say that the tones of Big Shell are similar tones to the Foundry. It's warm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's like, what is it like? Sunny and bright orange. What's and it like, teal and orange? Is like the color mm-hmm. palette? Yeah. Even when there's like the scene with the sunset, like the tones even of the sunset are not even bright. Like They're not like pink and purple. So they're very like orange, like the same color as the tanker. Like they don't even change anything for yeah. it through any of the game. It's, it's just really weird to think about. What, I wonder if that also that ties into the theme of two. Oh, yeah. Again, I, I, I've said this before. Maybe we shall talk about two when we get to two. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> right now we're talking about some heavy, sh- you know, Master Miller Fox die shit. It's just, it's interesting to me that, like, these are the sort of conversations you don't get to have often about games because uh, I just feel like Kojima and his team approach game making differently. They approach yeah. it like, like artists. Yeah. I don't know. And Artisans. As, as opposed to, yeah. like, uh, as opposed to like a, a design blueprint or a template or a factory, which I mean, a lot of games nowadays get treated like products and not like pieces of art. Yeah. Uh, well, they, it, they have like a formula you follow and you stamp it out and then you put it on a shelf, whereas it feels like there's a lot of artistry that goes into these games uh, that his team makes. And I mean, it's not just his team, but we're playing Metal Gear, so of course we're going to be talking about it. Um, but I, I, you could say that uh, Kojima that tradition goes back farther than... Because that's very common now, to have an artisan-crafted game with like, an auteur stamp on it. But, I mean, it's hard to think of someone before Kojima that put his name... Like, his name stands out just as much as Metal Gear does on that box. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we are joking about that in episode one, where it says, you know, Kojima is in the name of the titles, and by the time you get to the Metal Gear 4, uh, it's all Kojima. He mm-hmm. does everything. Yeah. But and he kind of set that standard. It seems because he cares so much about... <laughs> if I'm going to put my name on it, I want to make sure it's quality. Should that elevator be going faster because you're doing a snake fan <laughs> on it? Should it be like propelling it up? You lift it up out of the base and fly, <laughs> yeah. fly into the rips sky. rips through the ceiling. <laughs> and then you end up in space and that's the end of the game. <laughs> you just asphyxiate in space. That's yeah. it. Okay, is this where there's landmines? How has this series not gone into space at this point? <laughs> at any game, what, or any movie series or game, any uh, past like the eighth entry, which I think technically um, Phantom Pain is should be like number six or seven, there is always a space entry. At some point, the characters go to space. I mean, even fucking Jason Voorhees from the Friday the 13th oh series has gone to space. Space Jason. Leprechaun has gone to space. Yeah. When is Solid Snake? When are we going to see Solid Snake in space? Let's start the campaign here, people. Please, God, no. don't start that campaign. I don't no. want to see Salt Snake in space. I don't want to see. That, that attests to the level of quality of the series. <laughs> that Salt Snake has not gone to space. Once he adopts a chimp and goes into space. I want to fuck. No, I want to see Solid Snake <laughs> adopt a chimp and go all around the world no. on an arm wrestling competition. Uh-oh. That, that camera always Yeah, that tricky me. camera. That tricky camera. Even Call of Duty has fucking gone to space. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Even Call of Duty has gone to space. Yeah. He's going to kick your ass. I know. I just kept running at it. When a camera shoots you, now I know to run away from it, not hey, at it. Hey, you learned. Don't you sit there and wave? Because, I mean, it's a camera. Right. Yeah, well, you smile at the camera. That's what I tried to do. Okay. <laughs> but it didn't react quite the way I thought it would. Snake is a camera whore, so. <laughs> Get, make it go faster. Make it go faster. Go, elevator. Go. It's kind of actually hard to do Snake Man. <laughs> well, the first game, yeah. He's got to practice and get really good at it. Yeah, I know. Compete uh, in competitions. <laughs> Man, we completely talked over that whole uh, Master Miller pointing the finger at Naomi. Yeah, kind of suspicious, huh? Uh, hmm, what is up with her? Yeah, yeah, and they're interrogating her right now. So. But That's the thing is, it's interesting is, is he actually wrong? Is mm. Master Miller actually lying about that? That's the question we have to ask, answer later, but it's it's, yeah. it's complicated. Naomi never really is in any any of the games. She's never really a completely trustworthy character. 
She never really changes in that really, scene. She's kind of a douche. I'm gonna be yeah. awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna be honest with you. Um, and awesome. <laughs> You're always awesome. I'm gonna way. be awesome and honest. I hate Naomi. I think she's a terrible character. Yeah, just that's just because you hate all women. But true. Yeah. But I think that she's also a bad example of a woman. Oh. In, in a, especially like in a video game. Like in what way? Uh, I, I guess we're getting Domenica Solid Four stuff there. If I really wanted to speak. Okay. That. Okay. But do you feel like you hate her in this game from just what you've seen? Because we don't not, really know anything about her not yet. Not really here. Like, I feel like oh, this is probably a good room to heat up my heat. Yeah, look at these nice oranges and reds. I feel like in this game, like, she seems really, like, she seems like a genuine person. She seems like she's, where she's coming from makes sense, which is good. Like, it doesn't seem like she's, it makes sense why she's acting the way she is. I just feel like once it gets to Medicare Solid 4, that's when I kind of lose her. And I'm like, I have no idea well, yeah, what her, the fuck's wrong with Her you. presence in Metagross Solid 4 is kind of weird, too, because it's one of those things that almost seems kind of gratuitous, because a lot of the things that she does don't really make a whole lot of sense, and you feel like she's there just as a reference to this game. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just as a callback. And she does kind of she does a lot of similar things that she does in this game. But once again, maybe we'll talk about Metal Gear 4 once we get to Metal Gear 4. <laughs> but in this game... Um, I don't know. She's kind of, she's kind of aloof. You don't really know a lot about her in this yeah. room. We get the whole rundown with her and her backstory. Um, We're gonna get that pretty soon, actually. Yeah, another part of it. Yeah. Um, so maybe maybe we should hold off until we, because that's I feel like it's gonna be coming up pretty quickly. I really like the Steam? the no the rippling of the <laughs> molten metal in that one room. Oh, yeah, yeah, they put a lot of effort into that that liquid metal. It's just how much you can do, like. It's amazing what you can, what you can do when you're restrained. Like there yeah. was a there was a lot of uh, boundaries they had when they were creating this game, and I feel like it was to their betterment, like that they had those restraints to work within. Well, I think that's uh, why you have so much respect for Kojima, is because he is constantly doing that with any platform that he's given. Uh, I mean, he was pushing the boundaries with the MSX, uh, all the all the innovations that we're seeing here in the PS One. He carries that to the PS2. You love Snake Eater because of the way he pushes the limits of the boundaries of the uh, of the PS2 in that game. Mm -hmm. um, and he's even pushing the limits. I mean, he was given uh, for portable ops. I mean, good lord, right. that, that's almost a full fledged. In my opinion, that should have been. And Kojima's actually said this. That should have been Metal Gear Five. In, well, that was way, Peace Walker, wasn't it? That's what I meant. Yeah, yeah Peace, Peace Walker. Walker. The portable ops is that's neither here there. I meant I meant Peace Walker. <laughs> Portable Office is back Solid 5. Yeah, the, I do not mean that. <laughs> <laughs> Redacted. <laughs> uh, yeah, Peace Walker. Advance. Peace Walker should be Metal Gear 5, and Kojima's actually said that he he was limited by the platform it was on. But, I mean, as much as you can do in that game is just amazing. Yeah, on a, on what was originally the PSP, it's yeah. crazy. Those restraints can sometimes be a good thing because... It forces you to get more creative sometimes that you have these boundaries uh, when you have when you have uh, wide open like do whatever you want possibilities mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes you're less creative yeah I definitely like I can understand that personally just like working with doing paintings and things like that artistically like I work much better when I have a solid assignment where I have boundaries and I have to work creatively within those boundaries and just thinking of I think the thing that Kojima does instead of other, maybe other developers, seeing these things as a way to be creative instead of seeing them as excuses to make. Like it's, you know, seeing them as a nice challenge instead of seeing them as, oh, I can't do this because of this, so I'm just going to, you know what I mean? Just not, just not, be, not even bother. Kojima's like, well, if I, if I do it this way, this makes it way more interesting. Yeah. Like, I can do this, I just have to get creative about how I'm going to yeah. execute it. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, because wasn't the... I think Snake Eater was supposed, to be re was supposed to be held off until the PS3. And then they couldn't... They, they got, The PS3 got way pushed back, and so he had to, like, scale things down for the PS2. But because of that, uh, he was able to use it more creatively. And I think the same thing happened with, with Metal Gear Solid 4, where it was supposed to be later pushed back later, and they wanted to have a game on launch. So he had to really scale down his ambitions. And that ties us back um, into what we are talking about last episode with uh, Kojima re-exploring a lot of ideas because a lot of the things that we're seeing for The Phantom Pain are basically reimagined versions of the things that happened in Peace Walker with like the base building and, yeah. and uh, MSF, which is going to be Diamond Dogs now. And the main missions versus the side ops. Exactly, yeah. And so I think that's kind of what he... He likes re-exploring 
ideas he's had, but with more uh, capabilities. Uh, just to call it back to in this moment in this game right now. I guess what I really like about uh, Metal Gear Solid games that maybe some other people don't like are these like sort of long, these chests specifically where people really spill their guts about who they are and where they're coming from. I think he does that a lot in Metal Gear Solid 4 as well, where people kind of, you get to explore these people's stories. That's comical though, because instead of them telling them your story, it's Drebin yeah. giving you like the A&E biography of everything that's happened, yeah. <laughs> which is a little silly. But I, I agree with you absolutely, like here, what is your face? If, well, that's confusing if it's face or face or whatever, but you're talking to the person directly and they're spilling their guts out to you. Just like Sniper Wolf and Psycho Manus, they spill their guts to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, but that is... Very some, theatrical. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, that's something that does go back to Solid Snake in that that was when you, before the bosses died, I think I've said this before, they give you a little like speech that comes up in text and then they explode. <laughs> you don't really get that in Snake Eater though. No? Like the fear... The no, fear. you get a little intro monologue and that's about it yeah but this is where we're talking about we're gonna so this is the uh, naomi backstory we're talking about and it's it's like a pretty tragic backstory especially because it ties into uh frank yeager who's gray fox you killed my benefactor and sent my brother home a cripple i vowed revenge and joined fox hound it's kind of weird because we're talking about how whether or not naomi's a likable character or not but According to this backstory, she's got a pretty fucking brutal backstory. Yeah, I, I, I guess I shouldn't have said that I don't like her completely because I like her in this game. Yeah, I think she's she's understandable in this game. It's you're probably it's thinking of the fourth four. one. Yeah, yeah, they kind of twit, they I kind of fuck up her character a little bit. I, th I think so too. Well, also four, apparently Kojima was coming out of a bad breakup. Again, we'll talk about that more when we get to that game. But it kind of twists a lot of the female characters in that game because of it. She actually has a dramatic head shake. <laughs> she might be one of the better voice actors in this game as well. I'll have my revenge on them too. Naomi, you didn't kill that doctor too. Did you? Shit, yeah. I always spell his name wrong. Cuz I, I always spell gray with an e. Oh yeah. And it's always spelled with an a. Yeah. I never knew the difference between the two. I think it's European spelling. Yeah. I might be wrong on that. Yeah, it's complicated snake. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of weird how uh, we were always talking about how we're not that interested in Naomi, but we're really interested in Gray Fox's backstory. And then it's weird to think that they're like so related. Mm -hmm. They're so interlinked that you can't really have one without the other. Right. Yeah, and I think that that's why I was also disappointed, because I felt like she could be so Yeah, she could. they could have made more of her character. Because she has just as tragic as backstory as... Her backstory is very similar to Raiden. Raiden and Solid, Solidus. Absolutely. And then it carries over like the child, the child soldier thing that they developed with Big Boss back in the MSX games that we're going to see a lot more in the Phantom Pain. So this is like that first link of, uh, you know, the children of war and what that means and the soldiers adopting the people uh, that they've basically, the lives that they've ruined, trying to take responsibility for that. And it's interesting that Naomi is supposed to be representative of that. And she has a, she's a major... Uh, the plot hinges on her in this game, mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. And so she has a major role in this game. And then in... She also has a story arc. Yeah, she does it's have a story arc. She has character development, absolutely. I think you're right about that. But then they, they try to do the same thing in 4, and it's just it's just weird. It's weird in 4. We keep talking about it. Yeah. If well... You, if you haven't played it, you'll play it, and you'll understand. Yeah. That way, when we get to that game, there's no spoilers. You don't have to pull up that stupid <laughs> spoiler. We're going we balls just, out, yeah. railing on Naomi. That's... Uh -huh. <laughs> I think it's funny because we're constantly shitting on four, but I'm actually a fan of four. Yeah, <laughs> it's one of those things. But we're always going to have uh, someone who's a fan of a game because we're, we're, later on we're going to have uh, guests on who are fans of the games that we're not necessarily uh, the biggest supporters of. I mean, have, as much as I, as I shit on Metal Gear Two, you guys really like it, and not that it's a bad game, but it's just that we love it's a bad all. Bad game. <laughs> it's just horrible. <laughs> uh, I guess I guess I more so like what. Uh, what two like goes for and what it's trying like yeah two as a concept and what it's trying to do is what i like i guess eek ooh what was she trying to tell you she man? didn't actually say eek oh shit it's colonel god damn it he looks so evil in this game I know he like does. they do everything they can so to scowl. Evil. yeah his stoic scowl he looks like mr magoo <laughs> is what he fucking looks like he's like eh? <laughs> 
He does look like Mr. McGill. <laughs> what was that, Sonny? <laughs> Snake's all chin to rest. Snake's all chin down, eyes up. Yeah. Stop that fucking Metal Gear. Metal Gear. Metal Gear. All on right. it. You're on it. On this elevator ride, on the way down. And on that note, we are going down to the next episode. Tune in. See what's at the end of this elevator shaft. We're going downtown. Downtown. See you then.